coughing during the show. Well, good morning, everybody. Welcome to Community Free Church. Uh, it is good to gather together in the name of our Lord. Uh, if you are new this morning, we are uniquely grateful that you're here. We pray that uh, our time together would be a blessing and encouragement to you. Um, we all come to church uh, out of uh, a variety of different weeks. Um, I don't know what your week was like. I don't know what uh, you bring with you here uh, into the sanctuary, into worship this morning. Um, but we, it's our custom that we do a welcome, um, that I know if you've been here for even just a week, you've heard it before. And we do it intentionally um, because we acknowledge that uh, when we come to church, we are, uh, we are weak and we uh, are wounded and we are wayward in, in all sorts of different ways. And so that isn't just for those that are out there, um, that's for us as well. And so we come to Jesus together. Uh, as the weak, wounded, and wayward who have been loved by him in a supernatural way. So if you are weak to the weak, uh, who are tired and need strength this morning, uh, to the wounded who are broken, who've been sinned against, and need healing and wholeness, and to the wayward who have sinned, strayed against uh, God's good law of love and need Grace, uh, you are welcome here in the name of the living Jesus. Please stand, and we are going to do a call and response, call to worship out of the whole of Psalm 29 this morning. So please read along with the screen. Ascribe to the Lord, O heavenly beings, ascribe to the Lord glory and strength. Ascribe to the Lord the glory due his name. Worship the Lord in the splendor of holiness. The voice of the Lord is over the waters. The God of glory thunders. The Lord over many waters. The voice of the Lord is powerful. The voice of the Lord is full of majesty. The voice of the Lord breaks the cedars. The Lord breaks the cedars of Lebanon. He makes Lebanon skip like a calf and Syrian like a young wild ox. The voice of the Lord makes the deer give birth and strips the forest bare, and in his temple all cry glory. The Lord sits enthroned over the flood. The Lord sits enthroned as king forever. May the Lord give strength to his people. May the Lord bless his people with peace. We gather this morning to praise the king of kings, a king like no other. And so let's lift up his name as the Holy One.
God out of 1 Peter chapter 1, starting in verse 13. Therefore, preparing your minds for action and being sober-minded, set your hope fully on the grace that will, brought to, what, that will be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. As obedient children, do not be conformed to the passions of your former ignorance, but as he who called you is holy, you also must be holy in all your conduct. Since it is written, you shall be holy, for I am holy. Peter is calling us uh, to holiness because God is holy, because our God is holy. We're called to be holy, both in our conduct, our character, our allegiances, our hopes. And now more than ever, in some ways, in this season of life that we find ourselves in, we are called to be set apart, to be different, to be people of kindness and love and humility. And so we, we often receive that uh, command, you shall be holy, and, and we immediately go to guilt and shame about how we fail to live up to that. And we do. And yet in some ways, in Jesus Christ, as the Spirit empowers us, he changes our hearts to be able to respond to that by begging God to make us holy, to ask God to purify us, to choose uh, with his will, aligning ourselves with his will to be holy. And so we're going to sing a song uh, pleading with God, asking God to make us clean, to make us holy, set apart. Um, and and it's, a, it's an old song. Uh, it's a new song because we haven't really sung it here, but it's actually an old song. Um, I sung it in youth group, um, and it means a lot to me. And so um, let's, let's sing it together. If you don't know it, um, 
just receive it as a gift, and, um, and you can pray along uh, with us as we sing. thing is that in Jesus Christ, as we come to him in faith, he does purify us. He does cleanse us. Um, he opens us up to his forgiveness and grace. Hear these words from First Peter uh, in verse 17. <clears throat> and if you call on him as father who judges impartially according to each one's deeds, conduct yourselves with fear throughout the time of your exile, knowing that you were ransomed from the feudal ways inherited from your forefathers, not with the perishable things such as silver or gold, but with the precious blood of Christ, like that of a lamb without blemish or spot. He was foreknown before the foundation of the world, but was made manifest in the last times for the sake of you who through him are believers in God, who raised him from the dead and gave him glory so that your faith and hope are in God. We pursue holiness in Jesus Christ because God has already made us holy. He's purchased us. He set us apart and he's cleansed us, um, that we might be empowered to live as good, kind, and humble representatives of his kingdom 
on earth. And so we're going to sing of, of the finished work of Jesus Christ on the cross. He died that we might know the grace and forgiveness of God, and he rose that we might rise with him both now and forever. Good morning. Uh, my name is Tony. I'm one of the pastors here, and I'm going to be leading the pastoral prayer this morning. Uh, I'm going to read two passages from God's Word here before we pray, uh, just as an encouragement as we, as we move into uh, our next election here. 
Um, it's from First Timothy, the second chapter, verses 1 through 8. First of all, then I urge that supplications, prayers, intercessions, and thanksgivings be made for all people, for kings and all who are in high positions, that we may lead a peaceful and quiet life, godly and dignified in every way. This is good, and it is pleasing in the sight of God, our Savior, who desires all people to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. For there is one God, and there is one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus, who gave himself as a ransom for all, which is the testimony given at the proper time. For this, I was appointed a preacher and an apostle. I'm telling the truth, I'm not lying. A teacher of the Gentiles in faith and truth. I desire that in every place the men should pray, lifting holy hands without anger or quarreling. And I'm going to read a passage from Hebrews 12. This is verse 28. Therefore, let us be grateful for receiving a kingdom that cannot be shaken. And thus, let us offer to God acceptable worship with reverence and awe. So will you pray with me? Father God, we are grateful this morning, Lord, that you, by your grace, have made us your children. You've made us ambassadors of a kingdom that's not of this world. As ambassadors of heaven, and pray, Lord, that we would be a people that represent our king well. <clears throat> pray that knowing that we are a part of a kingdom that is unshakable, led by a king who is unshakable, pray that that would give us great peace and joy. Help us to care for our leaders, Lord. Help us to pray for our leaders, even when we don't like the way they're leading. Lord, in our family, in our church. May we pray for our pastors, Lord, our deacons and deaconesses in our church, those who lead all of the ministries, men's, women's, the children's ministries, Lord, uh, may we pray for them more than we complain about them. Let us pray for the leaders in our cities, our states, in our country, the leaders around the world. Lord God, let us reach out to the God who can do something about it. Father God, again, instead of complaining to one another or instead of worrying, Lord, I pray that, that our hope ultimately would rest in a God who's in charge, and not only who's in charge, but who loves us so much he was willing to die so that we could truly live. Help us, Lord, to, to have a confidence that is unshakable because it rests in our Lord Jesus Christ, and it's to him we pray. Amen. Good morning. My name is Valerie Schmidt, and I have the privilege of reading the scripture this morning. Um, it is on page 896 in the Pew Bible or on the screen, and starting in 1 Corinthians 3.18. Let no one deceive himself. If anyone among you thinks that he is wise in this age, let him become a fool that he may become wise. For the wisdom of this world is folly with God, for it is written, he catches the wise in their craftiness. And again, the Lord knows the thoughts of the wise, that they are futile. So let no one boast in men, for all things are yours, whether Paul or Apollos or Cephas or the world or life or death or the present or the future, all are yours, and you are Christ's, 
and Christ is God's. This is how one should regard us, as servants of Christ and stewards of the mysteries of God. Moreover, it is required of stewards that they be found faithful. But with me, it is a very small thing that I should be judged by you or by any human court. In fact, I do not even judge myself, for I am not aware of anything against myself, but I am not thereby acquitted. It is the Lord who judges me. Therefore, do not pronounce judgment before the time, before the Lord comes, who will bring to light the things now hidden in darkness and will disclose the purposes of the heart. Then each one will receive his commendation from God. I have applied all these things to myself and Apollos for your benefit, brothers, that you may learn by us not to go beyond what is written, that none of you may be puffed up in favor of one against another. For who sees anything different in you? What do you have that you did not receive? If then you received it, Why do you boast as if you did not receive it? Already you have all you want. Already you have become rich. Without us, you have become kings. And would that you reign, and would that you did reign so that we might share the rule with you. For I think that God has exhibited us apostles as last of all, like men sentenced to death. Because we have become a spectacle to the world, to angels, and to men. We are fools for Christ's sake, but you are wise in Christ. We are weak, but you are strong. You are held in honor, but we in disrepute. To the present hour, we hunger and thirst. We are poorly dressed and buffeted and homeless, and we labor, working with our own hands. When reviled, we bless. When persecuted, we endure. When slandered, we entreat. We have become and are still like the scum of the world, the refuse of all things. This is the word of God. Thank you, Valerie. With this time, I'm going to dismiss the children ages four through kindergarten. If you'd like, Kira's in the back, and they're going to have a lesson for their age, and they'll come back in during our closing songs. (laughs) Um, And Jason's going to lead a group of sermon translation. So if you can head to the cafe if you want to participate in that. I'll just say as we begin, two very brief things. In your bulletin, you received, uh, there's a handout. um, It has a pastor elder candidate we're putting forward for you to consider. Um, By bylaws, we have to put that out five weeks in advance. Um, I know we're not supposed to talk about who we're going to vote for uh, on November 5th, but on December 8th in our congregational meeting, I'm going to vote for Noah Gwynn. I'm comfortable announcing that. There you go. Uh, That's probably not a great mystery if we're putting him forward to you, but it's a great joy for me to have watched him. But in general, our church raise up Uh, women and men who are serving in wonderful ways and this would have us now as an elder board uh, a pastor in their 20s 30s two in their 40s two in their 50s and two in their 60s and we don't go for that as a plan but I think it I think it's going to be a wonderful thing so the other thing I'd mention if you were here last week just want to go back to our missions conference for just a moment we had several opportunities across the week to learn and serve and celebrate. And I want to say out loud that I'm thankful for what happened here. Um, Sitting in the pews, both services, which is really all I did, uh, participate with you as a both spectator and worshiper, I, I just, I found myself praising God for the color that was represented both up front and on the stage, and the reminder that, and, and, and even to see the progress our church is making in celebrating that red and yellow, black and white, they are all precious in his sight, and that heaven will be a place of different languages and nations, and seeing all of that, it was for me the answer to prayers that have been prayed a decade ago. 
that our church would make just a little bit more progress there. And I know others have been praying longer, but I, I was thankful. I hope you were too. This morning we come back to the series in 1 Corinthians, how the crucified Christ shepherds his fractured flock. We're going to take four sermons through the next two chapters, one this morning and three to go, then we'll hit Advent and break again. But we're picking back up with the truth that when you have Jesus, you have the one who is truly gold. And having him frees you from chasing all the glittering and kind of shiny praise of others. And so that's, that's where we're headed. If you'd pray with me one more time, we'll ask for God's help as we study this. Heavenly Father, this morning as we preach and pray and sing and gather and laugh and perhaps some going through burdens and cry and just share with one another those things, Lord, may we be reminded with the truth that Tony prayed a moment ago, that you are on the throne. And one day that throne in heaven will become a throne here on earth for all to see. We pray this in Christ's name. Amen. I took the title of the sermon, if you saw it on our email on Friday or, or here in the bulletin this morning, I usually don't draw attention to the titles of sermons, but I took the title from um, the last lines in verse 13 from our passage, The Scum of the World. <laughs> um, I would guess on a Sunday morning before the elections that some of you might want me to equate Kamala Harris with that phrase. There are others who would want me to do that with Donald Trump. There are others who would want me to do that with both. There are others who, whether you feel that way or another way, you don't want to hear any of those names because you hear them everywhere you go. And for those in the last category, that's where we'll mostly be this morning. But I bring it up to ponder for a moment the kind of anger that often our political opponents evokes in us, or at least we see in others. It's interesting that if we had done an exit poll right after church on Sunday morning, in early November, not here, but in the ancient city of Corinth, it's interesting that some people would have said that of the Apostle Paul. And sure, of course, some people liked him, many even perhaps. They loved him, maybe some thought too highly of him. He preached among them, did evangelism among them, planted that church. He, he, he led several prominent members of their community to faith in Christ, even baptized several of them, men such as Crispus and Gaius. And then we read of this household of Stephanus, mentioned chapter 1 and chapter 16. But there were others in Corinth who viewed Paul as the guy who left. Like, he did good ministry, but now he's gone, and he writes these letters, okay, but they're heavy and harsh, and when he was with us, he was not that impressive. He was a poor speaker, but, but Apollos, that guy could speak. And then think what would happen if we expanded our exit polls, not from the doors of church, but out into the marketplace. Oh, we, we know Paul. You know, some of you Christians think he's a big deal, but he's poorly clothed. He seems like he's not eating enough. And he's got to work with his own hands doing manual labor. I mean, that's beneath many of us. And on top of that, he's got to help you guys out in your dysfunctional church. We're not that impressed. And that's putting it more mildly than Paul himself put it. Looking at the last verses, some people thought of him as the scum of the earth, scum of the world, excuse me, the refuse of all things. He's just trash. That's what some would have said. Now, if you were Paul, if you were Paul, how would you go forward? That kind of mixed reception. Both loved and hated. Would the hate crush you? Would the praise elevate you, perhaps too highly? And who was right? Who had the true feedback? Who's the real you? And if you're Paul, even as you consider those who are 
complimenting those who are approval, those who, who do like you? What if even in their approval and their like and their, their favor, you could sense that oh, something is amiss here. It's like they like you too much, like they're sort of getting something from you out of their praise and connection and association with you in attaching themselves to you and writing, shall we say, your coattails. You know the reference of the Hall of Mirrors? It's to be surrounded by these misshaped mirrors. In one mirror, you look fat. In another mirror, it's kind of curved in. You look, you look skinny. In another mirror, your head is fat and your body's skinny or vice versa. How, how do you know how you really look? It's confusing. In our modern context, we just say, well, close your eyes. <laughs> look within. Believe that you're enough. You have what it takes. Forget what other people think of you. Now that might get you somewhere. But is there enough fuel inside you for when life gets really hard? When other people think of you as the scum of the world, and perhaps even when you think of that of yourself, the the, the Christians in Corinth, and I would say you and I as well, needed something more accurate. Something more clarifying, something more stable than mere human judgment. And amid that hall of mirrors, Paul found his hope in the return of Christ. Now, Many of us think of the return of Christ in exclusively negative, even fearful terms. When Christ returns, that's going to be scary. That will be bad. But that's, that's not what Paul thought. For the Christian, the return of Christ, the reality of God's final judgment, it clarifies things. It, it, it blows away the debris. It drowns out all the noise. It might say it straightens out the mirrors. But I want you to see that in this passage. So that's what we're going to talk about first, the return of Christ and what it means and what Paul thought it meant and what it means for you and I. And then how that return of Christ shapes and reshapes our view of all human judgments. We read the passage a moment ago when Valerie did so well reading it. We began not in chapter 4, which was really kind of where we were at in our sermon series. We went back just into chapter 3 just a bit to see kind of the flow of the argument. So I want to read those verses again and a few others. And I'm going to give a little commentary on it, like, okay, what's going on here? What's the flow of the argument? So if you have a Bible, just leave it open. We'll be reading from chapter 3, or it's on your phone, or whatever it would be. It won't be on the screen, but I'd love for you to see it in the text of Scripture itself. That's, that's really the most important thing, not what I say, but what's there. So chapter 3, starting in verse 18. Let no one deceive himself. If anyone among you thinks that he is wise, so think that he's special, in this age, let him become a fool that he may become wise. Now, later, Paul's going to say something negative about what appears towards judgment, but I would just point out here that, that Paul's asking us to have a kind of judgment, an introspection, as we consider our own life and, and whether the wisdom we think we have aligns with the wisdom that God has. So, verse 19, for the wisdom of this world is folly with God. For it is written, he catches the wise in their craftiness. And again, the Lord knows the thoughts of the wise, that they are futile. So let no one boast in men. Paul is talking about the praise of men and how essentially flimsy it is. And he contrasts that flimsy, futile wisdom and glory with something that is lasting, that that, that the believer would have in Jesus, that that you have in Jesus if you have Jesus and and could have if you had him. We, We continue here with verse 21, and, and Paul's describing what doesn't last now with what does last forever. For all things are yours, whether Paul or Apollos or Cephas, this is part of the argument he's been having about these teachers that, that were popular in the, their church. For all things are yours, whether Paul or Apollos or Cephas, or the world, or life, or death, the present, or the future, all are yours. And you are Christ's. If, and Christ is God's. I, I think the meaning here is something like, whatever you truly need, whatever is good and right that is taught by Paul or Apollos, Cephas, this, this other name for Peter, 
Whatever you truly need in this life, whatever you need now or in the future, or whatever you need to make it through this life into death and out the other side into your life forever, you have that in Jesus because Jesus has you. And, and you can hear the, the, the future orientation of his faith, which makes the comments now that come next about the return of Christ, not out of nowhere, but a natural continuation so in chapter 4, later I'm going to read verses 1 to 4, but, but just jump to verse 5. Chapter 4, verse 5. This was read earlier, but I'll read it again. Therefore, do not pronounce judgment before the time, before the Lord comes, who will bring to light the things hidden in darkness and will disclose the purposes of the heart. Then each one will receive his commendation from God. You see the lines here about the return of Christ let me read this again slower, just as this one verse, inserting kind of what I'll say are our, our, our perceptions ordinarily of the return of Christ. And I hope by inserting our perceptions of the return of Christ, that will make the actual meaning pop. So verse five, therefore do not pronounce, what's the word, judgment, right? Judgment's scary, right? Before the time. Oh, what time is that? When will this scary judgment be pronounced? Next words, before the Lord comes. Oh no, that, that sounds bad. So we ask, when will, or what will the Lord do when he comes? Like, well, he's going to judge, but what will that look like? How will he judge? What will that be like? Well, continuing, who will bring to light the things now hidden in darkness? Yikes, right? <laughs> if the Lord brings to light the things hidden in darkness, that will be scary and awful. What else will he do? And he will disclose the purposes of the heart. I don't want my heart disclosed. Do you? I doubt it. How does it end? Then each one will receive his commendation from God. Notice it says commendation, not condemnation. Different words, different meanings. Commendation just means praise. In fact, that's why Many of the English translations of this verse say, and each one will receive his praise from the Lord. Praise from God. Does that positive ending to the verse surprise you? If you think the whole verse is negative, we're not actually reading it the way Paul intended. For the believer in God, for the one who has had all of his sins forgiven, for the one who has been loved and cared for by God, for the one who has been put into the strong hand of Jesus such that no one can snatch them out of Jesus' hand, for the one who Paul says, in God, in Jesus, in the gospel, we have been given all things. For that one, the return of Christ is not a bad thing. It's the most wonderful thing in the world. The return of Christ is when the secret, hidden acts of devotion to the Lord, they get disclosed. With rather than be scaring, it will be when God holds up all the hidden, godly motivations that have bubbled up from the inside. In other words, it will be God's pronounce it that to the world that he says, I see. And now the world sees that when I love someone, my love goes inside and changes them from the inside out. And the hidden affections they have in their hearts towards me and those secret ads, acts of devotion that the world so despises, I'm holding them up and they are beautiful. I'll give you an illustration here. It's actually kind of a sad one. For years, I've wanted to join the choir here at church. Christmas and Easter we build these little riser things and you stand on them, you look so happy. I see Jeremy's up there in the front just. I wanted to join the Swahili choir we had last week too, but I wasn't allowed to do that either. Um, and I've wanted to join for many years and Ben Bachtel has always told me no. And you can say aw oh, if you want to enhance my sermon here. And David continues to tell me no as well. Um, there are reasons for this, uh, which are obvious to some of you who sit, stand next to me. But when we sing, but, but what if I told you every morning I wake up at 5 a.m. and I take the worship music off the stand on Sunday and then I bring it home and I, I sing, 
Sing to the Lord. A joyful noise. <laughs> Karaoke by myself. Um, now, I don't do that. It would be cool if I did. But, but I'm just trying to illustrate my point that, that, that there's something actually comforting in knowing that there is a judgment that's not based on mere talent or performance or gifting. I don't have to be like all the beautiful singers in our church choir. The Lord can love me and my terrible voice because he knows I'm singing to him. And I know I'm being silly about this, but, but you see how this can actually translate in, you know, into a context where the choir or the preachers or the deacons or whatever group, it, it, like not here necessarily, we hope, but, but if they were a bunch of arrogant people who thought of themselves too highly, into that context, the return of Christ to the humble, quiet, faithful, hidden believer would be great news. Let me go back to Corinth with me for a moment. We'll leave the Easter and Christmas choir behind. But the, the focus Paul has here on receiving praise from God at Christ's returns tells us about something about the issues they had in their church. And I suspect we could very well have in ours at different times too. The issue in Corinth was not that people thought too lowly of themselves. And they're fearful at the return of Christ. It was that they thought of themselves too highly. They were receiving the praise that was not really praise, not the lasting kind of praise anyway. You see evidence from this all throughout the passage, just to give you two of them. Look at verse 7, and then I'll point out verse 8. There's two questions, or three questions. I'm just going to read two of them from verse 7. Paul asks rhetorically, what do you have that you did not receive? If then you received it, why do you boast as if you did not receive it? I don't think that was like hypothetical for them. The questions imply that they had forgotten that everything they had was from God. And they're going around boasting like they made themselves the singers that they are or whatever. If you look down in verse 8, it's clear that they were assuming that they had already, they, they were already hot stuff and they had all the praise they needed. Verse 8 is intended to have sarcasm as Paul addresses them. Verse 8, already you have all you want. Now he's told them they really do have all they ever could need in Christ. But he's kind of just speaking like materially how they were viewing themselves. Already all you have all you want. Already you have become rich. Even without us, you've become kings. And would that you did reign. So that we, the apostles, your teachers, your leaders, might rule with you. Those in the Corinthian church had boasted about the stuff that they'd done and all the spiritual gifts they had. They were more interested in doing things so that they could put them on their college resume than rather than doing them for the right reasons. And they were more interested in being seen a good preacher than rather being a good preacher, more interested in singing in the choir than worshiping God in their hearts. And their love of theology was not about knowing Christ. It was a game to compete and see who could have the most baptisms or the biggest Bible studies or the most praise. And when they came to church, they were more worried about who had the best families and the best careers. Their following of Paul and Apollos and whoever was not about following their teachings. Their following of Christ was not really about following Christ. Their Christianity was about shiny, glittery things and people's praise that didn't last and wouldn't shine into eternity. They were living in light of human mirrors, human judgments, and not the final judgment. And I'll put it like this. I mean, you've heard of the phrase, you know, when a teacher grades on a curve. It's, it's like when probably the teacher gives a hard test and like the highest grades of 50 or 60 or whatever, and, you know, you inflate all the grades up to what would be the normal bell curve of, you know, grades, A's, B's, C's, or whatever it would be. And, and of course, every high school student's like, well, if we all just agree to do really bad, this would never happen, Mr. Hoover, what in your class. Let's all just do really bad, and then the teacher's going to have to, you know. But that's something of what was happening in this church in Corinth. Let's all just come to church and pretend that the most important things is how we look and how we have it together, and we'll just praise each other on things that don't matter and tell each other we have it together, and maybe it'll be true. And this was utterly unstable cause divisions. When we lose sight of the return of Christ, we 
lose sight of receiving praise primarily from God, then we're going to exhaust ourselves in getting praise and commendation from others. Paul is saying that the return of Christ clarifies things. It clarifies what is most important. It blows away the debris. It drowns out all the noise. Or we might say it straightens out all the mirrors. The return of Christ becomes utterly practical for the Apostle Paul, which is what he wants for us as well. Look at this last point. This will be much shorter. But the return of Christ allows us to know how we should relate to all human judgments. So we're talking about the return of Christ, then we're talking about human judgments. The judgment of Christ and the human judgments. This is so practical for Paul. Let me read the verses I skipped over, verses 1 through 4. After Paul says, whether all things are yours, the life and death, future, all of that, then Paul speaks of how that relates to human judgments. Verses 1 through 5 of chapter 4. This is how one should regard us as servants of Christ and stewards of the mysteries of God. Servants and stewards, those are the worst words. Moreover, it sh- is required of stewards that they be found faithful. But with me, it is a very small thing that I should be judged by you or any human court. In fact, I do not even judge myself. For I'm not aware of anything against myself, but I'm not thereby acquitted. It is the Lord who judges me. Therefore, again, verse 5, do not pronounce judgment before the time, before the Lord comes, who will bring to light the things now hidden in darkness and will disclose the purposes of the heart. Then each one will receive his commendation from God. Let me explain what he's saying using a line I heard from someone else. The good news that God loves Paul was for him at a volume of 10. And the feedback he had from others was at a volume of two. It's not that what other people think didn't matter at all to Paul. It does. He says in verse 3, it is a small thing that he should be judged by you or any human court. It, it, it matters to him, but it's a volume two. Not ten. The soundtrack to his Christian life is not constantly playing at full blast the feedback from others. And he's not even going to listen at full blast to the feedback, his own evaluation of himself. Now some of you just need to, you need to bring this close. You're constantly overwhelmed by what others think of you. Other of us are overwhelmed by what we think of ourselves, whether to lowly guilt, shame, negative things, or too high of things, all of which are ways of just constantly thinking too much and too often about ourselves. Paul says he's listening, but only to a point. He's looking in the mirrors around him, but he knows that those mirrors are often distorted. What matters most is the mirror of God's word and what God will say at the end of time. Now, sometimes people take this, only God can judge me, to the extent that we should never ever listen to others. That's not at all what Paul is saying. Or that we shouldn't ever say anything that could be perceived as judgmental to others. It's, you know, as though this license is just, only God will judge me, well I can do whatever I want and let others do whatever they want to do. That's not what Paul's saying. Verses one and two again. This is how one should regard us as servants of Christ and stewards of the mysteries of God. Moreover, it is required of stewards that they be found faithful. Paul uses two words to describe his ministry, servant and steward. Now, servant is helpful, like clarifying. It's not that he says we're CEOs of Christ that would come with different expectations. He says servants. And then he uses the word steward. We don't use that word very often. It, it, for us, probably the closest thing would be a financial context where some of us might give over or entrust our money for a time um, to someone else to manage our retirement account. There's a responsibility, there's a stewardship, there's the fancy money word would be fiduciary responsibility. They're supposed to do the right sorts of things with our money. Now, we would want them to be fruitful with our money, right? Like I, I loan my money to someone else to look after and I want them to actually make more money for me uh, so that it will be there someday for me or for others perhaps. But even more important perhaps, I want them to be faithful. I don't want them to do something wrong with it. 
And that's what Paul is saying we're supposed to be. Like, so the, the, what I'm trying to say is there's a judgment involved. There's an introspection. There's a, there's a consideration. It's not that all that judgment, all that is bad. We should be thinking about how. I mean, in fact, chapter 3, verse 10, Paul says, be careful how you build. Like talking about this metaphor of building on Christ and doing ministry and living our lives. Chapter 5, he's going to talk about judging. We're going to get there in a minute, um, in a couple weeks. About purity and, and, and the fact that they were not making the right judgments. It was bad to them. Anyway, that was somewhat of a parenthesis. But again, if what, ma- what matters most is the evaluation of Christ at the end of time. And that, living for that, is going to give you the kind of stamina you need. That we need to have the secret hidden ministry under the Lord. If we view God in the proper place and people in their proper place, I just th- th- think how freeing that will be in a practical way. We don't have to treat others in this church or your friends or family as stepping stones. Many of those in Corinth who said they loved Paul, they didn't really love him. They loved what Paul might be able to give to them. And those who loved Apollos and his wonderful teaching. They didn't really love Apollos. They loved what Apollos gave them in distributing religious goods and services. Now, that's not what he was doing. That's often how it was received. Having the proper view of the return of Christ and the final judgment causes us not to view others as competitors, it's like, oh, there's only so much grace out there in Christ. And if, if he gets it or she gets it, then I can't have it too. And we remember Paul's words, all things are yours. So I'll end here. I just come back to those last lines in the passage about being regarded as the scum of the world for following Christ. And, and that may feel over the top. This will be as close as I get to anything of a political comment in this season. But I, I just, I watch the same commercials you all watch, I'm sure. So many thoughts come to mind. And I thought about one of our church members who works as a counselor at a pregnancy center in the city. Helping women make hard choices. Encouraging those mothers with the help they can receive before and after the child is born. And I thought about the way the hidden, that hidden, unassuming, despised work by some is so important. Where will the kind of strength come to maintain love in that context? I think it comes from remembering at the return of Christ. God will hold that work up and say, this was good. This honored me. Read the end of the passage and then I'll invite the worship team to come up and we can give some instructions about communion. Verses 8 through 13. Already you have all you want. Already you've become rich. Without us, you've become kings and would that you did reign so that we might share with, or the rule with you. For I think that God has exhibited us apostles as last of all, like men sentenced to death because we have become a spectacle to the world, to angels and to men. We are fools for Christ's sake, but you are wise in Christ. We are weak, but you are strong. You are held in honor, but we in disrepute. To the present hour, we hunger and thirst and are poorly dressed and buffeted and homeless. And we labor, working with our own hands. When reviled, we bless. When persecuted, we endure. When slandered, we entreat. We have become and still are like the scum of the world, the refuse of all things. And I guess I just... As Jesus makes us into this kind of people, not not that we want to be some of those things, but that when we are viewed as some of those things, we could respond that way. When he does that, he'll be making us into people who were like him. 
The one who was sentenced to death. The one who was persecuted. The one who was reviled. But blessed us with his cross. Free, undeserved. That we, as we sang, might be holy. Let me pray. Would you join me? Heavenly Father, we thank you for the sobriety that comes from thinking about the end. We think too little of the end. And I just pray that you would would blow away the debris and quiet the noise so that our hearts could be still before you. We pray this in Jesus' name. Well, at our church, we, we take communion. Some of you have been vi- or visiting this morning and maybe never participated with us. Um, in a moment, I'll ask our servers to come forward and, and they'll put a piece of gluten-free bread in your hand and uh, just hold it out and then you can take a cup. And if you just bring it back to your seat, um, you do not have to come forward. You, you do not have to participate. You're welcome to. Um, if you'd rather just sit and think and pray, maybe use this time to consider some of the things that have been taught, but... Um, uh, no one will think less of you for that. This would be an opportunity for those who are saying, whether you're a member of this church or not, you're, if you come forward, you'd be saying, okay, I know I need forgiveness in the Lord. And it's through Jesus that I can have the return of Christ be for me, not a fearful thing, but a wonderful thing. Um, the worship team's gonna lead us in a song they can just sing over you. It actually comes from Similar but different passage from Romans 2 about the Lord and bringing things to light. And when everyone's been served, I'll come back up and we'll all participate together. If we could have our ushers come forward, the Kirby's and um, Heisey's. Thank you. Judge, here is my heart. What can I say to you? Where could I run? How could I hide? Darkness is day near. The heart of man is amazed within. So come like the wave. Sealed. All is revealed, Jesus, I feel to you. The church of the secrets of the hearts of men. Here I surrender. my soul now be its defense the judge of the secrets of the hearts of men Conquered my 
of the secrets of the hearts of men. Here I surrender and humbly repent. You've conquered my soul. We're so close to being done. <laughs> One more song. Um, that's a precious song to me. It was played, I was first introduced it, to it by um, our volunteer worship leader at the time, um, David Barreca, almost to the weekend, 11 years ago when I did my first candidating sermon here. We were in another building, but it's the first time I'd heard that song. 1 Corinthians 11, the Apostle Paul talks about Um, the Lord's Supper, and I'll read his words and we'll share together. For I received from the Lord what I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me, the body of Christ, broken for you. Take in faith. In the same way, he also took the cup after supper, saying, This is the cup of the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Until he comes. The the blood of Christ shed for you, take in faith. And sing. is reached for me and holds me from the raging sea I know you say for the solid the Lord is my salvation I will not fear when dark
just a moment. Um, on communion Sundays, we often have people standing at the door holding a tray. We take a special offering for what we call benevolence or just needs in the community or in the church that uh, arise and fall outside of the budget. And actually, the origins of that come from 1 Corinthians. Um, in their context, they would have a bigger meal for communion, and the rich would go, and they would eat, and tons of food, and there would be nothing left for others. And so in, in light of kind of not doing that, we ha- want to have a special mind and we've had this for a decade or longer, that on Communion Sundays to take an offering for those that are most needed. The, um, there's boxes at the exit doors as well if you want to give a regular offering. But just here, if you're visiting, we, we would love nothing more than this service would to be a gift to you. And feel free to walk right by all of that. Hear this word of encouragement as you go. This is what Aaron, uh, the Lord told Moses and Aaron to say over the people of God. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. And may he do that now and forever into the age. Have a wonderful week.